Welcome to the Unmuted Podcast. Uh, my name is Jeff, your host of the podcast and also founder of uh, Scale HR. Um, so this is the podcast where we talk about all things HR, talent, HR tech, world of work, and then anything else that might be relevant. Um, so we drop episodes every week on Thursday, uh, so normally uh, uh, Thursday morning, and um, the episodes live on our website at GoScaleHR.com. And also on the YouTube channel as well. So don't forget to, you know, subscribe, like our video, share your comments because the comments are great. Uh, you know, try to be nice, um, you know, not too uh, sarcastic and rude. Um, you know, but if you want to sort of drop drop a few F-bombs, that's totally cool with me. Um, and um, so we've got a great show today uh, and a fantastic topic and uh, guest. And so the... Topic is called the engagement equation. Data needs action. Okay, so you know, for all of you HR people out there, you probably are thinking, yes, another episode or a video about employee engagement. But you know what? We're gonna give it a go and take a stab at this because it it's been a long journey. I think you know. I think you know. You know, employee engagement has been a sort of top of mind. You know, a lot of us for you know, many years for quite some time. And, you know, I think we've made a more considered effort over the years in all industries, all levels on employee engagement to, to, to try to boost it. Yet, are we really making any impact or positive um, impact? And then, and then according to a recent Hayes report, 71% of workers want to leave their current job in the next 12 months. So that's a pretty big number. And then, I mean, if you keep going, get into more research from Gallup, which was actually one of my favorite uh, research um, uh, uh, you know, outlets. The employee engagement in the U.S. has hit an 11-year low. So in Q1 of 2024, engagement dropped by 3%, from 33% to 30%. And so some of you may think, well, that's not much. But that actually equates to 4.8 million people. Okay. So, I mean, this is pretty staggering. So there's a lot going on. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, you know, despite all of the effort from organizations to try to boost engagement, we're still not getting it right. And the trend is actually more seen in uh, younger employees, so under 35 years of age, um, and people who feel less connected to their organization culture, or also in people, um, you know, employees who could lose, sorry, who could do their jobs uh, remotely, but work exclusively on site. So there was a disconnect there, obviously people being forced to work on site, but could do their job you know, from home or elsewhere. And the third area is that we're seeing more of this um, impact is on employees who only work from home. So you've got the sort of two ends of, uh, of the spectrum. And so th there's a lot to unpack here. So don't forget it, it, it moving from uh, uh, data to action. So how do we use data to actually drive action? And so our guest, uh, Larissa Akura, do you want to help us break this all down? So uh, Larissa, you know, welcome to the show. Hey, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So let's get into the first question. So it has nothing to do with HR and, and the topic itself, but Please tell us, you know, what you do, your background, and maybe even where where you live, because that's a, you know, I know for people like yourself, that is a source of uh, pride. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, the easy question to start. I love this. Um, so, global HR yes. leader, predominantly within the tech space. Uh, I've spent my majority of my career here in Waterloo region, um, just outside of Toronto. Most notably, I supported the growth and scale of Magnet Forensics from under 100 employees to the IPO on the TSX in 2021 to the exit with PE firm Toma Bravo in 23. Um, and lately, I've been spending a lot of my time over this year doing consulting and fractional work with women-led businesses to support them with their HR needs. Uh, and I've also been volunteering in the community here with Women's Crisis Services as well. So you mentioned uh, a Waterloo. So you live in a Waterloo, not uh, Kitchener, right? It, that <laughs> yes, I live in Waterloo, not Kitchener. I just want to make that clear. Um, <laughs> we're a great community here. Um, if you live in the region, yes, there are distinctions between Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo. Yeah. 
Okay, so good. All right, thank you for that. Um, and so we will share where you can find, you know, uh, your contact information and uh, so on, and so we'll sure. you know if you share that. Um, uh, so let's dive right into the topic. Okay. Yeah. So what are some key metrics or types of engagement data that um, organizations should be focusing on? Yeah, I mean, great question. Uh, I will dive into the engagement side, but I really think where we should start and where people, leaders all need to start if they're not already is really looking at the larger, larger organizational plans, objectives, and, and narrowing down their people, data, and metrics from, from there. Most likely than not, you have OKRs or KPIs sitting in that larger organizational you know, objectives that start there and then, and then break those, those down for sure. Um, and then, of course, once we get into the employee engagement side of things, you know, that ENPS is, is so imperative to really get a pulse. I like to look at it a little bit more as like employment brand of, you know, how likely are people going to refer folks to come work at your organization? Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, really taking a look at, you know, internal mobility within your organization, scores on engagement surveys relating to career mobility and those types of opportunities, manager training, and the impact of that on engagement surveys as well. Um, and really holding your people leaders accountable for, for that, that score, uh, along there and really aligning that senior leadership team with those scores and with what's really going on. I think another different way to look at things in terms of getting a pulse on what's going on in your organization might be tracking some level of what are your sick time or short-term disability claims looking like vacation utilization, yeah, what's the outstanding employee relations issues, um, really to help kind of inform that current state uh, pulse. But then also, if you're tracking these metrics over time, seeing what the ebbs and flows of these metrics look like, along with regular business cycles, um, to kind of anticipate what's coming, right? Um, I think we can all agree that typically after an increase round uh, internally at an organization, you can see sort of a drop off trend of resignations. <laughs> um, right. and, but until you're tracking that data to really see it, you can kind of monitor and, and anticipate and be anticipatory with what's to come with your people data um, and being proactive versus reactive. Um obviously uh collecting data is a bit of an exercise and you know um do you use any kind of a platform to to, uh, to do that or are, are you a spreadsheet person are you off the you know napkin side of your desk type of thing you know because i think you know one challenge is to figure out what the right uh tool to, uh, to use yeah so maybe totally i think depending on your size and stage you got to use what's at your fingertips yeah. right uh for me, where I'm pulling a lot of my data and metrics when I'm in-house is coming from that HRIS uh, and really ensuring that my people processes within my teams are sound so that that data is actually as, as aligned as possible. We're not on a system implementation conversation, but what's really key for me in those dynamics too is being aligned with finance, who typically holds a lot of that headcount uh, related financial information. So if that's linked to finance or if it's not, I really also try to ensure that whatever those numbers are, are as linked and tight as possible there to make sure the metrics are are as accurate as possible. And then from there, yes, some manual level uh, currently, if you're smaller, um, to get kind of the numbers that you're needing. But then you've got great tools for engagement um, type surveys that really help you with some of that data as well, like Lattice, Culture Amp, depending on, right. on what your team is using. Um, so leveraging whatever systems you have in play, for sure. So you mentioned uh, survey. So that sort of segues into my next question, actually, is really how often, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you should be surveying or, or sort of reaching out to staff to, to generate their, um, um, you know, thoughts on things. And it's a bit of a tough question to answer, but mm -hmm. I'm going to let you go for it. You know, yeah. Sure about it. I mean, going back to even your first question, right? I think you really need to gauge what what your organization's appetite is for that as well. Uh, you know, I've worked in organizations where we're being measured 
against ENPS, the leadership team, um, it was. So we were doing it every quarter. Um, I've also worked in organizations where we've only done it annually to really just get a grasp. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both. I would say my sweet spot of where I'd prefer is semi-annual. Um, and why I say that is just from a perspective of I really want to ensure we're sharing this information outwardly, not only aligning it with the leadership team to create true action from what this qualitative data is telling us, but giving it time to also percolate and, and form to, to know that we've actually moved the needle on what that feedback was. So I found with quarterly, it felt very rushed to try to hear the feedback, analyze it, get everybody aligned, share it outwardly, make the shift and change before the next survey went out. Um, where on the annual side, it also felt like we waited way too long to really get a pulse to see, are we really moving that needle or that difference? So yeah, I think semi-annual would be my preference to move it. And I don't think you need to go as deep when you're, when you're doing it frequently as as maybe what we were in in the organization I worked at where we were doing it quarterly, but enough where you can get the information and give yourself enough time to to get things right. um, going. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my question about the the frequency or the cadence, I guess, is you know, so when your preference is to do it sort of twice a year, I guess, sort of half a year, yeah, six you know, six months mm -hmm. and, and then twelve months. Are you talking about like a full blown like bigger type survey because obviously you know there are a lot of organizations out there that um are hiring quickly there's a lot of shifts and movements and so um you know they may want to take a more of a pulse survey approach or they may do yeah. something like bigger every six months or whatever but then they may want to do like a really small pulse after every three months or you know something like that what are your thoughts about that Correct. I think I think inter introducing the pulse in between those semi-annual would be a perfect way to capture very small targeted. Are we moving the needle on these things that we've said we are? Um, so not a full blown blown survey, but yeah, a pulse would be fantastic. And I think if you're in a size and stage where you've got the platforms to do that so easily, hundred percent leverage leverage those to really yeah. again capture that data set of. Are we getting it right, <laughs> or did we do we need to step back here and actually relook at how we're executing on on whatever these objectives are that the data was telling us? So we just talked about the dashboard sort of data collection part of it, which was the first challenge. I think sort of getting that part right, but I think the second challenge and probably the more important challenge is okay. So you've already done that. You've gone through the you know data collection exercise. You know now what, right? So it's actually leveraging the uh, the results of the employee engagement data so what is the most effective way to to do that for sure we i think we're both in the same group where recently we saw a, a, an anonymous question posed by an hr professional that said my organization doesn't want to share the results of this engagement survey what what should i do <laughs> Um, I think Jeff, your your response there. I think we we all read it and shook our heads, right? And I think we just we have to get comfortable with sharing the feedback and being transparent, like whether the good, the bad, the ugly. Everybody, like I think this also goes back to the stats, right? Like we got to stop withholding, and we actually just have to acknowledge and like hold the mirror up and go, okay, we're not doing this right, and share that. You know, I think that's that's where maybe some of this disengagement is coming from, you know, from from folks in in workplaces. If we're not being clear and transparent about what's going on, um, we're, we're losing folks uh, through that process. So I think step one, like share the feedback and be be transparent. Um, and it might be ugly, friends. And I think we need to be OK with that um, and, yeah, and and own it. And then we yeah, can go no, further on. That. Yeah, I was just saying we can go further on, right, of really taking that look at analyzing what this qualitative information is saying and narrowing it down to themes and actionable takeaways that that you can take to your leadership group and, and get people aligned and agreed on, right? Um, we, we're in a very unique time, you know, we're in layoffs, we're in, you know, economic times where we are having to look at our budgets. Doing everything is probably not possible. So really creating that alignment and understanding at your leadership level is so important 
to, to get that vision of, okay, we know we can't do all of this, but what's the one thing we're going to commit to if that's all yeah. we can do um, and, and share that, right? And I think when you get up in front of folks and you can say, we hear you on all of these things, and my hope would also be you're being financially transparent with your team already for them to know and understand where things are at. We can't do this all, but we're going to commit to this for right now. And it yeah. doesn't mean that we didn't hear you. It's just, this is what we're going to commit to. Um, and I think when you've shared that outwardly, you're, you're being transparent on what you can and can't do as a business and you're acknowledging that you're seeing it, I think we'll start going a long way with folks if, if you're not already doing it. Yeah, I think those are excellent points. I think the first thing, you know, you know, you know, that I've seen a lot of, you know, my work anyway, um, is that uh, for some strange reason, HR leaders or business leaders think that um, if things are not perfect, then they can't share anything. And it's like, well, no, you know, there's no such thing as being perfect. You're, you're an organization made up of, of human people. Uh, you know, there's always ways to improve. And so why not, you know, you know, sort of embrace that. I think people will, will you know, latch on to a message <clears throat> that is like, look, we're doing all these things because you asked us to. Um, but we want to strive to hear. We still have a, a way to go in these are the things that, that we're doing. Uh, to me, that is a much um, more stable, believable, credible message than just saying, oh, you know, you know, everything's fine. You know, but nothing to see here. I think the other thing is to go around frequency of communication i mean i think that if you go through an exercise of, of collecting data and then you don't there, there's no no peep on it for three months that's a problem because it's like well what's the point of me you know exerting my effort to give you all of these great ideas and feedback and you're not even you know sharing it with us so i think um you, you know people have to be the employees have to have to feel part of it um, and they have to feel that they believe it. And I think that those are the things that I think would drive a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So, so you talked about, you know, obviously still in a really tough um, economic uh, situation. Uh, you know, I think that's still the case nowadays. Small business, mid-sized, large, you know, doesn't really matter. So how can we drive engagement in an economic environment with layoffs and cost-cutting uh, cost measures? Yeah, for sure. I mean, top of mind for really any chief people officer, VP or PNC leader who's really carrying that budget, right? And I think my my advice would be, you know, use this qualitative data you're going to get from your engagement surveys or through your exit interviews, through your onboarding surveys of folks to really dial in on what what matters for people right now. And, and then that way you, you can start looking at your budget to say, what do we need to keep and what, what needs to go? Employee needs have really changed uh, in, in a post-pandemic world. And I think as people, uh, people, people in businesses, we can get really wrapped up in creating these wonderful programs and these wonderful things for folks. But if they are not being leveraged or utilized, table it right? Like table it for now, readjust where those funds are going to make sure they're going to where, where your team needs and wants it right now. Yeah. So, I mean, one top of thing that comes to mind, I know we're in this dance of like the remote, the hybrid, the back in house type movement. You know, if you're that hybrid team and your in-house traffic is significantly down because really you're really truly working a remote setting, but kind of hybrid, and you've got the in-office perks still going, to me, that's like one quick fix of where you've got some extra dollars that could be redistributed to, to something else that might actually be really mattering to your, to your employees, to your folks. And as I said earlier too, we can't do it all right now. So it's, it's probably dialing in on what's that one thing that, that the majority are really driving towards in this thematic data that we're seeing and, and trying to move that that needle there. Yeah. And well said. You know, I think it really has to do with you know, people's expectations nowadays and needs have changed. So, uh, so, uh, so what are, so just flipping things around a little bit, talking about uh, uh, disengagement. Right? So, um, so what advice would you give HR leaders or other business leaders, you know, that matter um, in dealing with disengaged teams and, and 
Yeah. What, one, I just want to acknowledge, like I see and hear the struggle um, from the peers of mine who are still in-house, you know, whether you're on leadership teams or whether you are that head of people and culture leader, like it, it is a challenge right now. Um, and I've, I've been having conversations with a few different folks on on some different things that are, are going on. Um, but I, I really think we all need to take a hard look internally at, at what's working and, and what isn't. Because when we look at what some of this data is telling us from, you know, the gallops, the haze, there are organizations out there still thriving in their, in their engagement. And, and what they are doing is they've built within these flexible hybrid working models, like they've figured it out. Um, they've set clear expectations in their organizations for people. And, and further to that, they've got a really great leadership group who are coaching their folks through these, these tough times. Um, they've got great onboarding programs and they've got wellness resources in place because we all know folks are also not doing okay. <laughs> On top of being completely disengaged, they're also just not okay. And when you've really thrown that trifecta of all those wonderful things together, you do have an engaged team. So I would suggest leadership teams to start with, take a hard look internally at what's not going well. You know, we've got a lot of pressures from, from boards, from investors, you know, if we take ourselves out of that for just a second and really start looking in our organization of, have we set clear expectations with the team? Have we created some trust and transparency about what's going on in, in the business? You know, really bringing it back to basics to try to rebuild a level of trust within that disengaged group will, will go a long way. But I think it's just really stepping back for a second and and taking a hard look internally at what's what's going well and what's not, because uh, it could be a variety of things in your business, or it could be very specific to one area. Yeah, no, those 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 are valid points, and I think you're sort of you know on money, and it's not easy, you know, it's hard. So uh, based on that, so what is um, one thing, just one thing that you know viewers watching this can uh, you know take away from all of the great things that you shared today. What is that one, that one thing? This one thing would be let your engagement data drive your decisions and rewrite your budget to meet the employee needs at your, at your organization. Oh, here's a jump.